thank you, Dennis, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you all for coming today. As Dennis mentioned, I'm talking about technologies um, that we use to explore the ocean. And this one slide, when I'm done with it, is going to kind of summarize my entire talk. And this is a bunch of different oceanic phenomena that occur at different time and space scales. So on the vertical axis here, we have time. On the horizontal axis, we have horizontal spatial scales. And we go from very small processes, molecular processes, um, they go from particle to particle interactions, small scale turbulence in the ocean, to patch sizes, turbulent patch sizes in the ocean, um, surface waves, internal waves. So when you have two different water masses that are separated by a significant density gradient that can support internal waves, you have internal waves as well as surface waves in the ocean. We have surface tides, plankton migration, if you guys were here last week, you heard Jim Sullivan talk about plankton migrations in the water column. Um, typically, zooplankton will come up to the surface at night and feed and go back to the bottom during the day, and then the opposite for some um, migrating phytoplankton. And we go all the way out to seasonal mixed layer depth, uh, seasonal effects, cooling and heating, um, upwelling. And we go way out to large scales. We have El Nino Southern Oscillation, which we're currently in a very strong El Nino. And then ultimately, climate effects, which are very, very long time horizon um, events. So the challenge from a technology perspective is to try to resolve these different processes with different platforms and different sensors. So one platform that we use is a tethered mooring. So tethered moorings obviously have a very limited horizontal spatial scale, but they can sample as quickly as a minute, and some of these moorings have been out for decades. And uh, there's literally hundreds of moorings now around the coastal United States, uh, mostly in embayments. If you want to put a mooring on the coastal shelf, it has to be a really expensive, big mooring um, that requires a lot of attention, at least six months um, servicing, so it's, it's expensive. Um, here in Indian River Lagoon, Dennis actually uh, manages a system called Lobo Observatory, um, which is a, a whole sequence of a bunch of tethered moorings. So one very transformative uh, piece of technology is polar orbiting satellites. And NASA has put a lot of different instrumentation on satellites to sample the Earth. One of the most important is ocean color, which I'll talk about quite a bit today. Um, but as you can see, the great thing about orbiting satellites is you can resolve almost the entire planet in a day or two. So you get this incredible synoptic view of what's going on in the ocean. The, the first satellites with imagers went up in the late 1970s, and it really transformed how we do oceanography. And then the satellites have been orbiting now for, in some cases, decades different satellites, but they overlap, so we have a, a climate scale um, record of ocean color. So it really resolves a lot of very difficult phenomena from a technology perspective. So it's a, it's a very um, powerful technology. There's also geostationary satellites. Geostationary satellites, once they're in orbit, they're just looking at one place on the planet. And you can resolve, you can measure the uh, ocean color and other properties of that one place very rapidly or relatively rapidly. So in a matter of, say, every 15 minutes, you could be sampling one area of the ocean for ocean color. Um, but you don't get the larger spatial area coverage that you do with a polar orbiting satellite. So the conventional way that we sample the ocean is with a research vessel. And as you can see, research vessels have a broad swath of processes to spatial and temporal timescales that they can resolve. The problem with the research vessel is it's very expensive and we just have a few. So an ocean-going research vessel will cost up to fifty dollars to $60,000 a day. So what we're trying to do as a community, what we tried to do over the last couple decades, really, is try to develop new technology that can go out and autonomously sample the ocean with at least the same resolution, in much case, much higher resolution in terms of space and time, but a far, far less cost. 
There's also overflights. So you can have cameras on airplanes. You can have a bunch of other different types of sensors. Look at things like temperature. Um, you can even resolve uh, structure vertically with laser imaging. And as you can see, you can sample a relatively large spatial scale in a pretty short period of time with an overflight. So that's the advantage of overflights. These are autonomous underwater vehicles. And I've combined here both propelled as well as gliding vehicles. What's nice about these, are these are the kind of vehicles I was just mentioning that we've been trying to develop that in many cases are just tens of thousands to put out, to buy and put out and they're in the ocean. Um, and they can collect really amazing data sets. Uh, in most cases, far greater data density than we can collect with ships um, at far less cost. Profiling floats, so these are not tethered. You throw them out in the ocean, they're like hot air balloons. They go up and down in the ocean collecting data. And uh, these now, we have thousands of floats in the ocean throughout the world. And these are really powerful sampling technology that I'll talk about uh, a little bit more later. And in total, we pretty much have all those processes resolved. So then it becomes a challenge, too, because, you know, it leads to these concepts of an observatory where you have all of these different ty types of technology all resolve, resolving different spatial and temporal scales. And um, there's a lot of observatory initiatives that have been started. There's a National Science Foundation Ocean Observing Initiative, which they've just completed the infrastructure for. So now we have the infrastructure in the ocean. Starting in January, they just started transmitting data. Um, and I, I haven't looked at the data. I don't know the quality of the data yet. But um, it's a huge undertaking. It was a half a billion dollars appropriation from Congress. So um, we're very optimistic about the um, use of this data set for a very long time period to, um, to resolve oceanic processes. There's also, with NOAA, an integrated ocean observing system. And there are 11 of these throughout the country. And the one for Florida here is called Sakura. So I'm going to start talking about the, all those different platforms that I mentioned in that first slide. And I'm first going to focus on remote sensing. So this is uh, ocean color derived chlorophyll concentration on the entire planet from the years of 1997 to 2006. Um, this is from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. But you can see amazing detail of all these larger scale features in the ocean. I, I note here in the southern Pacific, this very, this purple water, it's extremely clear water, so the most clear water on the planet. And I'll, I'll show some, um, some pictures of that water later on. You can also see equatorial upwelling here. You can see a spring bloom in the North Pacific that then regresses to a summer bloom, a spiked summer bloom in the poles. Over here you've got the monsoons. So it's an um, incredible amount of data that we didn't have. So we knew things like upwelling occurred on western boundary of continents. You know, a lot of mesoscale from ship sampling, a lot of mesoscale phenomena, but we, had, we didn't have the data that, that we needed to really study and quantify those phenomena and then try to interpret that in terms of climate change. And so almost all current climate change models you hear about a climate change model that comes out and is predicting so and so degrees, um, you know, are going to increase in the atmosphere and the ocean over so, such a period of time. Almost all of that data is initialized with satellite derived measurements. Here you can see this upwelling off the coast of Africa. And this is actually because the, the world is spinning, the earth is spinning. As it's spinning, it shifts water offshore so that water needs to be replaced. And so deep water is upwelled. The deep water is filled with nutrients. It comes into contact with light and causes these phytoplankton blooms. Here you can see the Amazon River outflow. And this is the Orinoco uh, outflow. So a tremendous amount of information. You have the imager on the satellite, but there's also a whole sequence of technology, a whole suite of technology that's used to calibrate the sensor, to interpret the data, to validate the data, et cetera. So I'll talk about that a little later on. This is some very high resolution data that was collected with an imager called HICO, which is Hyperspectral 
imager of the coastal ocean, and this is mounted on the International Space Station. And this is where we've done some work in Western Lake Erie, but you can see the incredible detail of um, a very strong toxic bloom of uh, cyanobacteria called microcystis. So when you think about the satellite imaging problem, you have solar energy coming through the atmosphere, and the atmosphere scatters light and it absorbs light, and then you're left with some incident light on the ocean surface. That light is then modified by the waves, and then once it's in water, you have scattering due to particles in the ocean and also by water molecules. And then there's also a decrease in intensity from absorption. Those are the two main processes. So it's really pretty, pretty simple. Those are the two processes that you have to quantify. And then at the satellite, you're looking at water. The color of the water that you're seeing is purely an effect of those scattering and absorption properties of all the stuff in the water which are things like phytoplankton, which showed some great images last week, and Jan Ryan's also several weeks ago showed some great images. And the challenge then is to connect this very fine scale, you know, sub milliliter type volume information of all the absorption and particulate scattering that's happening to the very big scale that the satellite sees. So this is a really interesting video. I don't have time to show the whole video, but Two kids in high school put Lego Man with the Canadian flag on a weather balloon and sent it up. It's really neat to see the video because as it goes up, you can see the atmospheric effects change, modify what we see looking down more and more. And so this is at 80,000 feet. And at 80,000 feet, you can see just pretty much a blue glow. And that's due to scattering off the water molecules in the air as well as aerosols. So when a satellite imager looks at the ocean, about 90% of that signal is from the atmosphere. And we need to correct, we need to remove that to be able to look at ocean color. I had a, a colleague at Dalhousie in Canada say that this is pretty much the extent of the Canadian space program. <laughs> there actually are several Canadian astronauts. Um, so with ocean color, you obviously have all looked at the ocean and looked at water and you see that it changes color. That, that change in color is a function of all the stuff that's in the water. So this is off the California coast where it's relatively oligotrophic because it is an upwelling area. There's a lot of phytoplankton in this water so it turns the water green because of the chlorophyll and other pigments uh, that the phytoplankton have. In the Mediterranean you get this deep, deep blue. It's relatively dark. So the reflectance, so the reflected light from the sun coming out of the water is, is very little really compared to other places. Um, and it's because it's not only water doing the absorbing and scattering that I would mentioned, but you also have some dissolved material and some particulate material, but at a much less concentration than you have uh, off somewhere like the California coast. And then really truly pure water actually has a very bright violet look. And it's, it's really um, breathtaking when you see it. Um, this is the very clearest water in the world in the South Pacific Ocean. This is right outside Easter Island. And uh, this reflectance, the, the intensity of the, the light leaving the water is several factors higher than in these other two places because water is dominating the reflectance and it's a very effective um, scatter of light in the backward direction. It's very bright beautiful kind of violet lavender. So I mentioned there's a lot of different technologies that are required for ocean color and mode sensing. You obviously have the imager. This is a picture of the imager for sea whiffs. Sea whiffs have eight different color bands. And then as scientists trying to validate the radiance that sea whiffs is measuring, so we deploy, deploy radiometers in the ocean. So these are light meters. And they look at light coming in in every different direction. And we try, try to quantify that. And we can do things like, I mentioned the very strong atmospheric correction. We can use these measurements to try to validate those corrections. There's also above water radiometers. This is a very important buoy called MOBI, which stands for uh, Marine Optics Buoy. This is deployed just south of Hawaii in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, and there's a counterpart for this buoy 
in uh, the Mediterranean called Boussole. Um, this buoy is very important because this is the buoy that's used to calibrate drift on this satellite and other satellite imagers to this day. So it's, it's been in operation now for, um, for decades. Um, as you can see, it's got long arms here. And there's radiometers mounted at the end of the arms. And these radiometers, there's a whole team that do nothing but calibrate these radiometers and characterize these radiometers for deployment. There's two different MOBIs. This is MOBI 2. I took a picture. We did some work uh, next to the MOBI buoy a few years ago. Um, this is buoy 2 that they put in this rack here. They go out to the site, they dump it in the water, they take MOBI 1, put it back on the rack, and they do this every six months. Um, and they need a big University of Hawaii research vessel to do. So it's a big, expensive program uh, for calibrating the satellite. But this is the, the key way that we calibrate um, drift in the satellite. And when we start to look back over decades, calibrating this drift at a very high level is extremely important for climate change. Because in climate change, we're trying to resolve very small changes um, in things like reflectance out of the ocean and the properties of the ocean. So there's a push now. We're in now a new phase where we're planning for the next imager to be launched. And this imager is called PACE. And it's scheduled to be launched in the 2022 time frame. And I'm on the PACE science team. Uh, Jim Sullivan, who's also at Harbor Branch, is on the PACE science team. And we're in the process now of trying to define a lot of the specifications for that imager so it's consistent with the needs of the research team, research community. Um, and part of that is new calibration methodologies and protocols. And so this is kind of a miniature version of a MOBI where you've got, it's a profiling float. So this aut autonomously profiles through the water column. And we have radiometers here on arms to measure hopefully very, very high quality um, light data that we can use to calibrate this, the um, satellite in the future. Um, this was just presented at Ocean, Ocean Sciences Conference last month, and it's a concept that's currently being developed by a company called Wet Labs and Seabird. Um, so we have high hopes for that. This instrument package is kind of what our group specializes in. So once you go from the satellite to light and ocean color at the surface of the ocean, then we need to interpret that reflectance in terms of all the stuff that's in the water. And the first step in that is water has inherent optical characteristics. And that's what this package measures here. There's also a radiometer here. This dome is uh, a radiometer from Ken Voss's lab at University of Miami. And that resolves hemispherical light coming down into the water. Um, so this package here has a bunch of sensors to resolve optical properties of water, as well as things like size distribution of the particles, chlorophyll concentration, all those properties of the particles and the dissolved material in the water that we're trying to quantify with remote sensing. So this really provides the link to that and allows us to develop algorithms to, to use that data effectively. And then this is a towed vehicle. We call this the Dolphin. It has a lot of the same instruments that are on this package, but you can tow with it, which is great because as it tows, you're getting that depth um, resolution as well along tracks. So you, once you interpolate, you essentially get a ribbon of data and you can do all kinds of different tracks and I'll show some examples from that. But that's, it's turned out to be a, a very effective way of doing this ocean color remote sensing validation. And here's a close up of one version of that package where I'm highlighting the sensor here. So I mentioned that the two main processes in the ocean that affect light are scattering and absorption. And this is a device called the mascot which is multi-angle scattering optical tool uh, for measuring, measuring scattering at multiple angles. So there's a source here, a laser source, and this little cube here is a little sample volume. And all of these detectors are focused on that sample volume. So it measures scattering from 10 degrees to 170 degrees. And this is the only sensor in the world that can make these measurements in water, in undisturbed water, at very high fidelity. So there are some instruments that measure on the bench top, but once you collect the sample and bring it to the bench top, you're disturbing a lot of the particles, sensitive aggregates and such. 
There's two of these in the world, and they're both here at Harbor Branch in our lab. Um, to talk about some other uh, platforms for sampling, this is a conventional profiling platform off a conventional research vessel. So we call this a CTD rosette, and the C stands for conductivity, which we'd use to derive salinity, temperature, depth, and there's usually a variety of other instruments that we put on there. There's like turbidity sensors for looking at you know, approximation of particle concentration, chlorophyll concentration, that kind of thing. And then these, these tubes here are actually bottles that you can use to sample the ocean. So as it goes through the water column, we can trip the bottles at different depths to collect water and then do analyses on them. Another type of vehicle is a remotely operated vehicle, or ROV. This is very, very efficient, very effective at looking at relatively small areas in great detail. It's got thrusters so it can maintain position very, very well. It's got robotic arms that can be controlled remotely because it's tethered. Um, so people at Harbor Branch have done a lot of great work with ROVs, particularly around coral beds, um, sampling corals and sponges and whatnot. So it's a very um, powerful tool, especially for sensors that require a lot of power. So some imaging systems, um, LIDAR systems, so laser imaging systems have been deployed off of these vehicles. Another type of uh, platform is propelled autonomous underwater vehicle. And they come in all different sizes. Uh, one of the most popular is the Hydroid Remus family of vehicles. Um, Hydroid is, is based in Massachusetts and um, really excellent engineers who've done a tremendous job in, um, in designing and, and fabricating and testing um, these vehicles for the community. This is another company called Bluefin. This is a Bluefin 21. It's called a 21 because it has a 21-inch diameter um, vehicle. Uh, on this vehicle, you can see that there are some probes in the front that are used to measure very small changes in current velocity in the water column. And then on top, we have that radiometer that was on our profiling package that I showed earlier. And there are some other uh, optical light sensors on top as well. This is a, a new AUV that's very, very compact. It's only about a half a meter in length, and it's about five inches in diameter. It's from Riptide. Um, the AUVs uh, definitely have advantages in that they do have a relatively extended range. You can go up to several hundred um, kilometers. Um, you can put a lot of different sensors on it. Uh, you def definitely have power um, limitations that you have to abide by. And typically, these, these are deployed on a daily basis. So you put it in the water in the morning, it will go through the day or go through the night, you pick it up the next day. In some cases, they've been deployed for several days. Um, because they are so um, power intensive, power hungry, um, typically it's just a day to a few days deployment. So we actually have uh, a proposal in right now to work with these riptide vehicles. And Fraser Dalgleish has developed a concept for a laser imaging system that's small enough that could actually fit on one of these vehicles. And then we can map coral beds and other benthic strata um, across the, the shelf off the coast of Florida here. So we have our fingers crossed on that one. Um, another platform is called gliders. There are several different gliders that are commercially available out there. Um, this is the spray glider. This is a, a sea glider from University of Washington Advanced Physics Lab. And what these gliders do in, in all cases is adjust their buoyancy by essentially fill a bag to change their volume. And as they change their volume, they change their buoyancy. They'll start sinking or they'll start rising. So in this case, it's at the surface. shows it transmitting data. So in this case, it transmits data through its fin. And then it adjusts its buoyancy so it's negatively buoyant, and it starts profiling through the water column. Then it adjusts its buoyancy again, become positively buoyant, and does an upcast. And it keeps doing this. And because you're only using power when you're changing the buoyancy, these can be out in the ocean for a very long period of time, so several weeks. Um, this one in particular can go down to 1,000 meters. This is another one that's very uh, popular in the scientific community, the Slocum Glider. 
And we've installed several different sensors on the Slocum glider in the past. This is some of the data collected off the New Jersey shelf, showing salinity. Uh, and then here at the surface, you can see effects of the Hudson River plume. These are, are optical measurements, but they're optical measurements that are a proxy for particle concentration. So you can see a lot of particles associated with the plume, but you can also see a lot of particles associated with resuspension events near the bottom. And then this optical proxy here is a proxy for organic versus inorganic mineral type particles. So what this is showing is there's a high percentage of mineral particles near the bottom. So we can not only characterize the, the concentration of particles, but also the composition of the particles with the optical sensors that we have on these vehicles. And you can see that if you were to go out in a ship and collect this is about a five kilometer length here. So if you go out to collect a, a single vertical profile through that, and then if you're trying to model the dynamics in the area of particle movement, say sediment bed fluxes and stuff like that, you'd have to make an extrapolation that um, might have significant error because there's obviously a lot going on in that coastal regime. So depth range, uh, the spray and the sea glider have depth ranges of 1,000 meters. The Slocum has, it's more for coastal uh, continental shelf work, so it has a depth range of 100 meters. Um, its duration typically is a month, but there are exceptions. In particular, the Rutgers glider group sent a Slocum glider across the entire Atlantic. And it took it, um, I think, 200 days and it traversed about 7,000 miles when it was all done. But um, it made it. So there, there are exceptions. But for the most case, um, for collecting high quality data, it's, it's typically a month. Uh, the payload is very compact. So as you can see here, this is only about a foot in length and about eight inches in diameter. And the power, um, there are definitely power constraints. So these sensors actually were developed for the glider, so I'm going to show here. So these are sensors that make measurements that are the highest quality measurements that we make as far as optical properties of the water that we can use to characterize particles and all those things I was talking about. But as you can see, this is the payload section of a glider, and you're not going to fit those in the payload section of a glider. So we had to develop these sensors that make the same measurements almost at the same quality but in a much, much smaller form factor. It's also hydrodynamic. And they also use just simple LED light emitting diode light sources. So it's very, very low uh, power consumption. And we did this in uh, collaboration with the Rutgers glider team and Oscar Schofield. Another type of platform is profiling floats. These are incredibly useful um, platforms and there's tons of them all over the ocean right now collecting uh, very, very important data for a lot of different applications. The most um, prevalent one is called Argo, developed by Teledyne Web. And you can put, as you can see, a variety of different um, sensors on there measuring a variety of different properties of the water. Uh, another one that, that has come online to the community in the last year or two is called Navis from Seabird Electronics. And then this is what I showed before, the, a Navis that's been adapted to hopefully be a, a calibration platform for uh, future satellites. It's called the Navis OC. And the Provor is a French version of um, these profiling floats. But again, uh, what these typically do is they change, they're at the surface of the water, they change their ballast so that they're negatively buoyant. They go down to a depth of approximately 2,000 meters. They'll stay there for one to two weeks and then do an upcast, transmit the data to a satellite, and then go back down to 2,000 meters and it just repeats that. And since you're only using energy when you need to change the buoyancy, these can operate for a very long period of time. These are out there for years, nominally five years, but there are some floats that have gone much, much longer than that. Here's a good example of using uh, float data to validate remote sensing measurements. So this is chlorophyll concentration here. This is a three-year time series. The vertical axis here is depth. And this is all the data from the float um, deployed in the Labrador Sea. You can see in the winter, the mixed layer depth dives way down. 
And it had a big, uh, had a big storm that came that year to make a, a very, very deep mixed layer, like mixed layer depth. And you can see most of the chlorophyll is in the surface. So what Boss et al. did was took the chlorophyll concentration at the surface and then compared it to the chlorophyll concentration derived from the satellite. And you can see there's a very nice correlation. The, the limitation of a satellite, even though it's incredibly useful, is that you're just looking at surface water. So you don't get all of this, this vertical resolution that you can get with floats and other types of platforms. So that's why it's very, very important to try to integrate all of these different platforms and the data and the space and time scales that, that they measure over. But it's, it's a very challenging thing to do. And not many people, to be honest, have, have really done it well to answer specific science questions. So this is uh, the Argo float distribution. This um, is a little old. This is 3,300 floats. Currently, there are almost 4,000 floats throughout the world. And there's more than 50 countries that are participating in the program. And this is an amazing data set that when we, we talk about questions like, is the ocean warming over time, this is the data set that's always cited. And it's definitively yes. And these were first Thurston was deployed in 2000, so they've just been out for about 16 years. So it hasn't been that long, but even over that relatively short time scale, we still know definitively, because of the amazing distribution and the quality of the data that's collected, that the, the ocean is warming. So the next type of platform I'm going to talk about is a towed vehicle. And I mentioned before that there was a counterpart to Moby called Busol. This is in the Mediterranean. And uh, we did a lot of measurements both around Moby and Busol uh, with this vehicle. But you can see that you can do spirals to kind of resolve in almost three dimensions what's going on after you do interpolation. What this plot is down here is taking that spiral toe and unraveling the whole thing. And you can see that there's a relatively strong chlorophyll layer here at about 30 meters. So that's what this color is, this is chlorophyll concentration. And then we can derive from all this data, that block of data, what the surface reflectance that a satellite would see. And about, this is about the size of a, a single pixel in an image that a satellite would see. Uh, this is another um, data set from Long Island Sound where we use this towed vehicle. And we made a north to south transect here. So we started, this is the outflow of the Connecticut River in Long Island Sound. So we started the outflow of the river, so we're in the plume, and then we, we went due south from there. And in the process of that tow with this vehicle, we made approximately, it's several hundred profiles. And this is salinity here as a function of latitude. And you can see in the northern part, there's a current of high salinity going towards the west. And then this is relatively low salinity coming to the east. And this higher salinity water is entrained open ocean water that comes through the mouth of the sound here. <laughs> and then these are optical measurements. These are raw optical measurements that we made. But what I want to point your attention to are these other properties that we're able to derive from the optical measurements. So PSD stands for particle size distribution. And the slope of that size distribution <coughs> is reflective of the relative amount of small to large particles. So when it's high, so when this is red, you've got a lot, of, a lot more small particles. And when it's blue, you've got a lot more large particles. Uh, the TSM here is total suspended matter. This is if you went out in the ocean, you collected a sample, you filtered out all the particles onto a filter and weighed it. So you had a mass concentration. That's what this shows. Percent POM is percent particulate organic material. So there's two types of particulate material. There's organic, carbon-based. Typically, um, it, has, it has a relatively low density. And then you have uh, mineral particles that have typically a very high density. And they have very different optical characteristics, so we're able to distinguish them. And then we have chlorophyll concentration here. But if you look at chlorophyll, it's clear in the southern end here that we have a bloom occurring. There's high chlorophyll concentrations. And associated with that are relatively large particles. And these were diatoms, relatively large diatoms that are phytoplankton that were in the water column that were blooming at the time. 
And then this water mass here that's entrained open ocean water caused the resuspension event here. So you can see a high concentration of particulate material, TSM, total suspended material, and it had a very low percentage of organic um, in, in its composition. So it was primarily inorganic sediments that were resuspended. And then with the, the plume of the Connecticut River here, you can see it's relatively small particles. There's no chlorophyll, essentially very little chlorophyll, and it's relatively high in organic material. So this is just showing the kind of data and the kind of resolution that you can get with one of these platforms and the sensors um, that are on it. And again, if you were conventionally going out with a research vessel and just taking individual profiles, it would be very difficult to get a synoptic picture so that you could then um, make sense of that in models and interpretations. Another platform is drifters. Drifters come in all different sizes. This is a very big drifter, approximately a meter. It's greater than a meter in diameter that was deployed in the Southern Ocean Gas Exchange Experiment that we participated in a few years ago. This is a drifter that we developed in our lab. It's a very compact drifter, and it's because it was designed to sample surf zone. And so when you're sampling the surf zone, you want as, as compact a drifter as possible so it stays with the current because that's what you're trying to resolve, current velocities through the surf zone. So the water line was right at the top here and this little cup here, which is the Iridium satellite communications, that's the only part that was sticking out. And so when, when you have breaking waves and you have wind, it's not going to be affected uh, too much by that. But we've collected a lot of data for the Navy of uh, optical properties in the surf zone because they were trying to, they were interested in trying to look through the, through the surf zone, trying to image things that might be on the bottom and developing technologies to, to enable that. But it's really amazing, the currents in the surf zone, we, we could put these in some surf zones and after 10 minutes they'd be half a kilometer away, like right here, right on right where the waves are, waves are breaking. So the currents there are really impressive. This is another uh, platform that I wanted to show you just because um, it was really a great experience working on this platform. It's called the CRAB, Coastal Research Amphibious Buggy, uh, at the duck facility for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, where a lot of great research has been done over the years. They have a fantastic facility there. But we, we mounted our equipment on this CRAB, and we were able to roll it out into the surf zone. So it has these big wheels. And then we can uh, profile through the middle. So we were able to collect a lot of data, a lot of time series data. We were specifically looking at bubble concentrations over time. And from those bubble concentrations, um, we can derive things like visibility. And most importantly for, for the surf zone, statistics and visibility. Because at any one instant, it's, it's almost impossible to predict how far you're going to see. But you can say over time, you've got an 80% chance that you will be able to see the bottom or whatever that percentage is. So we, we made those measurements for them. And an, uh, another platform finally is divers. And divers um, can be extraordinarily useful. Obviously they have limitations, but there are some things that only divers can do. This is a great picture of a colleague, Emmanuel Boss. He's got tons of equipment mounted to his back. And the thing that he's holding is a tube that's sucking in water to go through all of these different sensors. And so he went in and around coral reefs and a lot of different areas making very fine scale measurements that would be difficult to do otherwise. Uh, this here is a colleague, uh, Brandon Russell, and he's got a spectrometer looking at the, bo the bottom. So when we're looking at light fields, the reflectance off the bottom has a big effect usually in, in shallow waters on that light field. So he's quantifying that. But that's a, it's a handheld instrument that you have to have a diver to do. And then this is a wave glider platform here. We have uh, one here, I think, at Harbor Branch. I think we're getting another one soon. Um, but essentially, there's a, there's a bungee that connects this bottom structure and the surface structure, which is like a surfboard. And as waves come through the surfboard, it modulates that and propels it forward. So with, with all of these different platforms and all these different sensing technologies, um, they all have to be designed to withstand all the elements of the marine environment, which is really very challenging. One of the most challenging aspects that we're still struggling a lot with is biofouling. 
And here we've done a lot of experiments over the years looking at biofouling with different films. So all these different optical windows have different films on them. And obviously, light's not getting through a few of these uh, too well. But you know, our, our sensors are very finely calibrated, and we know exactly how much light is coming out that window. And when they get fouled, um, it completely changes the calibration on the sensors and the interpretation and everything. So it's a serious problem. Just mechanically, it can be a really serious problem, too, when you have muscles and all this stuff growing on, on structures. Uh, pressure, obviously, deep in the ocean, the pressures are enormous, and you need to build uh, sensors that can withstand that. Sea state, this is a picture from the Southern Ocean during that Southern Ocean gas X experiment that I'd mentioned. Um, huge waves, and it was on this cruise, actually, that this CTD rosette got damaged, and it was banged on the side of the ship, and the welded frame actually shattered, and it broke a lot of these, uh, these bottles here. And I could say I've been on research cruises in the North Atlantic in the winter where for two weeks we just had 20, 30-foot waves, and we got basically nothing done. So it's another reason why going out on an expensive research vessel is not always the best way to do science. And a lot of these robotic drones can be very, very effective, um, even in those kind of environments. Strong temperature gradients, you know, electrical systems are very sensitive temperature gradients. Electrochemistry in the water, pretty much everything corrodes in water unless it's titanium, which a lot of instruments are made out of titanium for that reason. Uh, very limited communications. And then animals can also be a problem. We've had seals go in and rip out cords in our packages before. And here's, we were in the South Pacific, we had a shark that was attacking our, sensor, our sensors. And so the, the chef got a, uh, this is a fish head. And he's, 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 uh, he's putting it in the water to try to distract the shark away from our sensors so we can bring it in real quick. So I think I have a little time um, to talk about imaging. Um, so this is some imaging work that we did off the Florida Keys and associated with the Naval Undersea Warfare Center. Um, so the Navy has this camera, and this camera is mounted on underwater vessels. And I can't tell you any more than that, but you can probably imagine what it is. And they're trying to image stuff on the hulls of ships. And um, what they found out in doing this over the last few years is that there are a lot of times where it was turbid and they couldn't really see much. So we developed this very compact optical sensing device that can sample the environmental optical properties and then predict how far the camera will be able to see for a specific target of a specific contrast, et cetera. So this experiment here was testing uh, that algorithm and that sensor integrated sensor package, and you can see contrast targets on the bottom of the hole here. And that went really well, and this is currently both the camera, or I should say a next generation camera, as well as this optical package are being installed on these underwater vessels now. This is some great uh, laser imaging work um, done here at Harbor Branch by uh, Fraser Dalglish's research lab. And the advantage in using a laser imaging system is that you can get finer detail than you can with a passive system, just a camera, or a camera with an active source. And you can also see over much, much farther ranges than you can with passive camera technologies. And then uh, finally, imaging, you know, obviously we're trying to detect things with imaging equipment, but there's also the inverse. And the Navy's very interested in this and trying to hide stuff in water which brings up camouflage. And with camouflage, you need to know, you know, you need to optimize your camouflage optically, but then you also need to know what the adversarial imaging system, its capabilities are as well in any performance algorithm. Um, to give you an idea, we, we've been involved in a project where we're trying to look at how animals do this in the ocean. And then, the whole idea is to try to mimic what they do in terms of the technology that we develop. And this is an octopus uh, camouflaging itself. It's 
So when it's fully camouflaged, it's truly camouflaged. It's really remarkable what they can do. So it's, it's matching all the different colors. It's ma matching the pattern of the colors, as well as brightness, which is really reflectivity. So it's reflecting all the ambient light that's around it. And these are all optical characteristics that, that we studied uh, in detail in, um, in our study. Um, this is one experiment from that study that I'll just I'll very briefly talk about where um, we developed in associated, association with Alex Gielerson at CCNY City College of New York. He developed this system here to look at basically uh, light parameters in all dimensions. Okay, so we knew exactly what the light field was around these fish. So this is specifically, this experiment was looking at fish. And then we also had a camera that was sensitive to polarization. And if any of you are photographers, sometimes you may use a polarization filter. But light travels in waves, and this little cartoon shows that light coming from the sun is unpolarized. So all these, rave, all these different waves are in all different orientation. It's completely mixed. But once that light bounces off a surface, it imparts a specific polarization to that reflected beam. And fish camouflage themselves. Their scales are like mirrors. So the light hitting the scales bounces off. And in doing that, they can very closely match the background color. They can also match the background intensity. But if they acted just like a mirror, they would actually impart polarization specificity to that scattered light, that reflected light, that a predator would be able to see. So that's what we wanted to test in this experiment. And what we found is that they have structures in their scales that actually scramble the polarization so it does actually look like the background. So that was the main finding in this study. So a final thought. Um, this is really a terrific uh, platform um, that I've been very fortunate to work off um, a few years ago called FLIP. And it was built by the Navy in 1962. And it's a barge, so it doesn't have any propeller, it doesn't have any motor. And what they start doing, it's towed out to the location that you want to be out in the middle of the ocean. They start pumping water into the end of the barge and it starts to flip. It essentially starts to sink. When you watch this happening, you th you're thinking it's going <laughs> to, the whole thing's gone. But it's not the case. What happens is you end up with this platform, this laboratory at the surface of the water. So it's 355 feet in length, and 300 feet of that length is underwater, is ballast. And what that does is it creates, it's called a spar buoy design, and it creates a tremendous amount of stability in making measurements so that you can have wave field going by and the platform essentially doesn't move. It's going to drift with currents, but it doesn't move relative to these waves. This was built in 1962, so it's been used for over 50 years. It's still used on a regular basis, literally constantly it's being used. And some of the very, very best wave research that has ever been done, and also surface water circulation research that have ever been done, has been done on this platform. It's a really remarkable platform. You can see there's three booms here. This is one boom that's, that's out, and that's a guy standing on it, and a guy, he's, he's playing with his sensor on that, but you can see, kind of get an idea of how, how big it is. Incredibly valuable platform. So recently, um, the French government said, we need a flip. And so they started going into design work and all the risk assessments and all that, and eventually they said it was impossible. So obviously it's not impossible because it's been done. But uh, the point is it was impossible with all the constraints that we have today in developing new platforms, new technology. So obviously there's risk assessment in terms of safety hazards. When this thing is flipping, they have toilets and sinks and kitchens and everything needs to be reoriented. So the toilets actually have two holes. <laughs> so you have to unbutton. <laughs> The, the kitchen, the, the refrigerator, the oven, the counter space, everything is on an axle. So as it rotates, it just act, rotates on the axle. It's really incredible. Um, so they said it couldn't be done, but it's, it's because of the regulations. It's because of the constraints in terms of safety, et cetera. There's also a story I like to tell about. Last summer, I was moderating a um, discussion of technology with undergraduates at University of Connecticut. 
And the discussions kept boiling down to, well, that would be too costly and uh, that might be dangerous and that could be a really risky thing to do. Um, these guys didn't think that way, you know. So they first looked at the science needs, the science problems, developed the concept, developed the design, and then figured out how to work the constraints around that. And I think this is the final point. I really think we need to do more of that today. I'd also like to point out that this vessel, as well as almost every piece of technology that I showed you today, was originally funded by our Navy, which is very impressive. It's not funded by corporations. It's not funded by other agencies. The National Science Foundation is the big premier scientific agency in the United States, did not fund any of this technology development, except for the CWIFS imager, which was funded by NASA. And so I'd like to close by acknowledging the research group that works with us. This is Skylar Nardelli. And Skylar um, is attending graduate school in the fall, and she's already got some great offers from some of the leading oceanographic programs in the country. This is Aditya, who's a postdoc, who specializes in bio, uh, biophysics. This is Nicole, and uh, Nicole pretty much does everything in our group. She's the engineer that puts together these packages. She processes all the data. She goes on the cruises, collects the data. And here, she's doing everything she can to collect good data. She's holding a GPS at the only place it's going to get a fix. <laughs> this is Malcolm, who's a postdoc in our group as well. Uh, his specialty is bio-optics. And this is, a, this is a coffee shop. Really, this hop and brew here is a coffee shop. <laughs> and this is Alberto Tanizzo, who's doing kind of a remote postdoc with us um, in uh, New York City, and he's primarily working on ocean color, and I can show him without a shirt because he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, I'd like to acknowledge all the collaborators I've worked with over the years. These are some, just some of them, um, but they're all great scientists, great people to work with, and I uh, feel very fortunate in working with them all. So thank you very much.